campaign director for the Northeast Marcellus Initiative of Energy and Debt. Uh, we have uh, some of our folks working here tonight, along with some of our other partners in this endeavor. We have uh, uh, a number of partners on this, including uh, the American National uh, Gas Association, ANCA. We also have API, the American Petroleum Institute, uh, our own organization, Energy and Debt, as I mentioned, the Marcellus Shale Coalition, and finally the uh, Pennsylvania Independent Oil and Gas Association. Uh, we also have tremendous support from various members of the industry who are here this evening on both the drilling side and the fracking side as well as the uh, other sides. So uh, we're, we think this is a great opportunity to exchange information on a great new program called Frack Focus. And we're going to give you a lot of background on it, tell you what it's all about. It's really an exciting new uh, venture that we're undertaking to ensure full disclosure uh, on a voluntary basis of everything that we do in the industry and to make sure that the message gets out that this is safe and responsible. So uh, with that, I want to also thank some people who are involved in this. Uh, first of all, all the industry people who helped out. We had a number of people from various companies who you saw exhibiting out front, uh, as well as, uh, as I said, fracking companies, uh, drilling companies, and other suppliers. So we want to thank all of them. A number of them participated in providing the support that we needed to pull this off today. Um, and we appreciate everything they've done. I also want to pay particular thanks to one of the people who worked with me, uh, Nicole Jacobs. Where are you, Nicole? Are you, are you here in the room? Um, I wanted to stand up if she's around. She probably stepped out. I told her to be available. Anyway, uh, Nicole uh, did a fantastic job setting this up. She was really the, the ringleader in terms of organizing and making all the calls, uh, all the logistics involved in such an endeavor as this, and really did a fantastic job. So, Thank you very much for that, and all the people who work with her. Uh, the, the point of what we're trying to do, as I said, is to uh, make sure that we are providing full disclosure of what we do and to get the message out that natural gas development is safe and responsible and good for the area. And one of those things that we need to do is obviously tell the technical side of this and disclose as much as we can about it. So what we'll be doing tonight is having three speakers give presentations on various aspects of natural gas development in our region. And uh, one is going to uh, talk about the frac focus program itself. Another is going to talk, uh, talk about the, the science of it a bit from a geologic standpoint. And the third is going to talk about the economic impact. So we're going to kind of run the gamut of, of uh, information on this industry and what it's all about. Uh, with that, I'm going to get started and then we'll do the Q&A afterwards. The first speaker this evening is James Hurd, who is a consultant on various regulatory projects with the American Petroleum Institute, one of our sponsors this evening. Uh, he is a, also a consultant to a program called RegScan on the development of computer-based environmental compliance audit programs for the industry. He's also uh, involved with the State Review of Oil and Natural Gas Environmental Regulations program called STRONGER. A number of you are familiar with that, which essentially evaluates the state programs. Uh, and he also served as the director of Pennsylvania's oil and gas program for uh, a number of years, uh, and is totally knowledgeable on this subject from the standpoint of our commonwealth and what the industry, how the industry has evolved, evolved here. Uh, he's also very involved with the Groundwater Protection Council, the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission, and a number of other activities. He has an engineering background. And with this, I'm going to ask Jim Hurd to come up here and give us his perspective on frac focus. Please welcome Jim Hurd. Thank you, Tom. Is this live? Yeah, it sounds like it. OK, I've been asked to give a demonstration on frac focus. And I'll start with a short PowerPoint presentation. And then go live on the web and show you some of the things that are in this web based stuff. Developing regulations on disclosure of 
hydraulic factory chemicals to the public. You can see the list of states on the screen. There are a number of other states that are currently considering disclosure rules. And there was a need to express by the various states to have some kind of a decentralized, uniform process for disclosure. Our focus was developed to provide factual information to the public about the process of fracturing and the chemicals used in hydraulic fracturing. What is frac focus? It's a web-based national hydraulic fracturing registry. And it's managed by the Groundwater Protection Council and the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission. Both of those organizations are organizations of states, state governments. The Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission is made up of the governors of the 30 some producing states that produce nearly all the domestic onshore oil and gas production. The Groundwater Protection Council is the state association of the groundwater protection directors and the underground injection control program directors. Both have visions geared towards conservation of the oil and gas resource and towards protection of the environment. The website was created with a with assistance with a federal grant to provide access to the public about the chemicals that are being used. It also provides a lot of additional information, background information on the what, the why, and the how. This is the home page of Pratt Focus. As you can see across the top and around the screen are a number of elements that you can go into to drill down for information. You saw on the hydraulic fracturing process itself, how it works, what all is involved. What measures are there as far as casing, cementing, and other measures that help protect groundwater. There's a section on regulations by all of the states. That section includes contact information and links to the regulations the states have. There is also a section on chemicals, frequently asked questions, and the really neat thing is the ability to drill down to a well to get information about what chemicals were used during the fracture of that well. If you're looking for a well, this is the search page that you, that you would uh, have. In this PowerPoint, the screen shows a well in Colorado. If you uh, do a search in Colorado, you see, in this case, Anadarko wells that go county by county through Colorado. Uh, I'm not sure how many wells on the page, but this is the first of 25 pages of wells in the dark had in Colorado. When you click on a well, specific well, this is the type of information you get. You have information on the water use, on all of the additives that were put into the water, just how much sand, how much surfactant, biocide, cropping agent, everything is listed. And there are the ingredients listed, as well as the chemical abstract service number for each of these products. The amounts that we use, the concentration in, of each constituent in the product, and the concentration within the track building. There's a lot of information. A number of states have adopted frac focus as their mandatory method of reporting completion reports to the state. These five states currently have them in final rules. The frac focus is the way that they must be reported. Uh, several other states are under consideration, Oklahoma, West Virginia, I have asked Scott 
library of Transylvania if he had any plans for adopting a rule here in Transylvania. He said right now he doesn't have any plans, but that may come in the future as they upgrade the computer system and are able to link the two together. So the jury still out on that kind of bell. Since Crash Coach has started that April, 115 countries are participating. As of Thursday, there are over 10,100 wells loaded into the system. You can see the statistics on number of visits, locations. It is a very active study. In the future, there are plans to make the search capabilities even simpler than they are, and when I get into the see how intuitive it really is. That there will be some operator tools to help upload the data to the system and to help operators manage the records and to build that link I was talking about between state databases and track codes. Before we get into questions, of course, I want to close this out and go on the web. There's 
the discussion on groundwater protection. The subcategories here are the water that's used, groundwater and aquifers, the testing and the quality of groundwater, well construction for groundwater protection, and getting into casing and cementing, and fluid flow on the subsurface of what happens down there and why. There are discussions on chemicals used in hydraulic fracturing, of why they're used, how they're used, which ones are used. And there is a link to the state regulations. You go to that and click on whatever state you are looking for. Get the contact information. You can link right to the state regulations. There's a report, an evaluation of the hydraulic traction program done by Stronger, which is a state review of oil and natural gas environmental regulations, a nonprofit corporation that is made up of stakeholder groups. They develop guidelines for state programs and then send teams in the states to evaluate the programs against the guidelines. And this review was done about a year ago. There's a link to that report. There is a section on frequently asked questions where you not only have a number of questions that are answered, general questions, but there's also the capability of sending in a question and having someone answer it. You give your contact information and your question. This goes to the Groundwater Protection Council in Oklahoma City, they either respond directly or refer it to someone who can give the answer to you. And then there's the find a well by state section. And we're going to do a standard search. And let's choose well in Pennsylvania. And let's see here, we're in Lake County, I believe. And let's pick it up.
We'll do one more. Let's jump over to a retired guy. And I know that the show has some of those areas. See what they have. CAS numbers. If you go in there, you copy the CAS number of a product that you have interest in and go to that link, you can get a lot of information on that product or on those chemicals. Uh, that's what I have for you now, so I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jeff.
out of school and I started working in the oil patch or the gas patch in Western Pennsylvania, uh, we drilled a lot of wells through the Marcellus. And the Marcellus was something that never produced any, any gas at all, really. And it was just sort of a nuisance to drill through it. There have been a lot of studies done by the, uh, the government that said, boy, there's a lot of gas in this rock. But we drilled through it looking for, for more productive zones. So what I want to try and do here today, and I, okay, normally I like to go through, I, I love to do stuff like this, and, and I don't have enough time to um, put you all to sleep, but uh, I'll do my best in, in 20 minutes. And I'm going to sort of try and deal with a little bit of the, the big picture of what's going on in the whole world in terms of this rock here, not just the Marcellus, but shale and general. So I'm going to take you through a little bit here, I'm going to talk about some of the chemistry, some of the best practices. I am not a chemist, I'm a geologist and a generalist. I've worked on a drilling rig, I've worked on pipelines, I've worked as a geologist and, and doing engineering, and I'm lucky enough to be involved with this company. We have about 700 employees in Pennsylvania. We started uh, in our, our headquarters are in Meadville, and it's been, it's been fantastic. We do have a, a great facility here in Williamsport. So, uh, you know, these rocks were formed, they're sedimentary rocks, they were the rocks that were the the different animals and vegetables and things as they were compressed in the ground and buried deeply in the ground and cooked just like the ingredients in a cake. Okay. <clears throat> the first thing that we saw of this, though, this was really fascinating, was that there were lots of, of seeps where this stuff came to the surface. People didn't use it. And, and there were lots of deep seeps. But I want to bring your attention to one which I think is really fascinating, which is what really got us going here. This was back in the 1820s, uh, 1821. We're going to New York, so, and you, I'm going to promise I'm going to try and tie this all together, but a, a, a woman was having a well dug, her uh, husband did it for a, a present, and uh, natural gas started seeping out of this. This was a, a water well that was being drilled, and a guy named Hart decided, hey, this is pretty neat. There's gas coming up. We should be able to do something with this, and he was curious about bubbling gas, and he set about drilling a second well. So right along the shores of Lake Erie, where these shales were cracked by the glaciers as the glaciers took the ground up and down and started having gas seeping up there. And he took that gas and it was sold to a lighthouse. And that was the first commercial use of gas. If you look at, and really that was something that seeped from the ground. If you look at Drake's Well, which is curiously also just south of there in Pennsylvania, that was because the Indians along Oak Creek would see oil seep to the surface and they'd look at that and use it for uh, patching uh, Sail, I mean, uh, sailboats, canoes and things. And Drake said, boy, it must be coming from somewhere. And so he drove well into another seat when the oil industry was, was born. Although if you talk to the Chinese, they were drilling wells back 3,000 BC, or a long time before we were, so I really don't know if that's a devious claim or not. But now with the discovery of, of shales, if you look at it, it's really this, this area down here that a guy named George Mitchell felt for a long time that there was gas in the shale and you just couldn't figure out how to get it out. Now, even though the newspapers and things you hear that that uh I call the crashing and horizontal drilling are new, they're not at all. I mean that's that's what our company's been doing forever. And actually a man back in the 40s started that process. In the old days here in Pennsylvania, you go to oil, you can actually blister in the wells that weren't so good to try and make some cracks that can go out further and connect things. I draw a fraction that came from that where people said, wait, you only put so much explosives in the ground. What if we could put the water in there and use water to make the cracks? So that was, that's what I draw a fraction. It's sort of not a great sounding name. But George Mitchell said, I see gas in these rocks. There's got to be a way to do this. And so using horizontal fraction, horizontal drilling, which I'll talk about, which had been around, and also using hydraulic fracturing, which had been around, he combined the two of them, and that became productive. A geologist up in uh, Pennsylvania, Bill Zaborski, was coming back from a well with a log in Pennsylvania or uh, Houston to check out to see if uh, he should plug it. When he came back, he said, boy, I saw this neat rocks the Barnett Shale in, in Texas. We were sitting at a picnic, and he brought the logs out and said, do you think you guys can, can fracture this, this Marcellus rock? He said, it's working. It looks almost exactly like the Barnett Shale. And one day we said, yeah, let's try it. And we basically shut our little company down, brought everything together with the rents. Number one well, which we said in uh, October 24, 2004, we, we fractured that well. And that well was put up. And then they did a horizontal well. And so that was this amazing thing which happened to our little company. We said, boy, there's something really great going on here. And we grew from that. And we became what I think are experts in that. Uh, again, you see the things that happen. What we're really looking at here is this 
rock is different than the rocks that are put out there. For all of you, I don't know if anybody in the audience wants to guess how many wells we have in the United States, but it's over 800,000. If you were to ask how many wells does somebody like Kuwait have, they produce about 270 wells. That's because their rocks are so much better than ours. We are now past the point where we have these great rocks that you could drill into, and oil and gas just came out of them naturally, and now we're tapping this, this stuff that's more difficult to get out of it. And the reason we're doing it is we don't want to send lives and money and things overseas. So this is what the shale looks like in an outcrop. I think I'll show you the piece afterwards if you want to come up and see me. But this is a piece, and what I want to try and show you when I'm going to describe hydraulic fracturing is when I see when you see J1 and J2, if you go down and some of these, these uh, stream valleys up in Pennsylvania, you'll see these shales have, have cracks and they're, they're oriented in certain directions. If you look at how this thing is got these, these lines up there, these are the natural fractures that are in the ground. Okay, to make this productive, we've got to do something with it to take advantage of that. But I wanted to show you this in an crop. And when I was a kid, near here in Pennsylvania, we'd go up there, and this was under underwater, you could hold your hand and the bubbles were coming up, and we'd light a little light on it. When I was a little kid 50 years ago, 45 years ago, we did that. So, how do we take advantage of that? If I cut the state apart in like, a, like a, a cake. This is what the ground looks like underneath there, stacked up. And I don't mean to be boring if you know about this, but here you can see sort of a picture. The green is sort of the Utica shale, which if you look at the cross section, like cutting a cake, you see the blue line up here where the Utica shale underlies the Marcellus. Okay? And here you can see the aerial extent. The yellow outline shows about the extent of the Marcellus where it would be productive. There is Marcellus up in other areas like up in here, but it's, it's too thin. And it hasn't, the ingredients haven't cooked properly. Okay, I'm not going to talk all about the, the casing and cementing, but again, I've been, I've been doing this for a long time, and I think I need to explain that one of the things we do when we drill down and, and put the horizontal well in place to contact as much as possible, I'll keep talking about that. There are necessary sheets of cement that go along there, and there's an awful lot of regulations that govern that, but I'll, I'll cover that for you later. This sort of gives you an idea of what a cross-section of a horizontal well might look like. We've got the aquifers up here, layer cake rocks that come down, different layers of steel casing and cement sheet. And then this, these three uh, Statue of Liberties that I put in here give you an idea about the height of the fracture that we created the ground. And, and obviously, if we just pump stuff out of here willy really, nobody would continue doing this. And the most exciting part of this for me has been to be involved in the geology and the morphology of, the, of creating fractures. And, and the papers that I've written for the uh, American Association of Petroleum Geologists and the Society of Petroleum Engineers, that's sort of the thing that's really gotten me excited because I work for a company that we fracture something under the ground that we can't see. So we've been spending pretty much the 30 years I've been in this business has been trying to define where's actually that stuff going and what are we doing about it. So I, I want to make sure that all of you out there know this is a something we used to later go on with this and type and pump it. Many, many of the wells in Pennsylvania have grew the first company involved that got a grant to do some imaging of what's going on under, underground, and I'll show you how we do that with micro seismic. Again, here are the different casing springs that are in the ground. Where there's also a huge body of evidence, and we start to get into it, like I said, we put all of you to sleep, but it's fascinating to me, that describes the orientation, the morphology of these fractures that are created depths and the, the stresses and things in the ground. There are huge departments of rock mechanics, and there, there are world famous guys that look at this. So, so here might be the wall board, and this might show you what the fractures look like as they come out of the, of the ground. And I don't have enough time to, again, I'm afraid of control the sleep, but let's pretend we're looking at a bird that flies over and that well is the blue dot there. These are those cracks that I told you that exist in the ground, the J1s and the J2s that you see here. What we want to try and do is to remove gas from this area inside that ellipse because these rocks are going to fracture in a preferential direction. Let me just show you as we start pumping water what it might do. The first thing it might do is move this way. The stresses in the rock are going to control which, which direction the fraction moves. Okay, that's going to happen. And, and we can map that and look at that. And that's well known to everybody that's working up here. Then it might intersect one of the J2s and travel along next to that. And then it will reestablish itself in this way. And our goal again is if, if, if you are a group of people here and you all have a little bit of gas, I should say that I don't want to make you a little bit of a restaurant or something, but anyhow, 
We want to get out. What we want to try to do is connect and find a pathway to connect with all of you out there. And that's the goal, because that's the problem with this rock. It's so tight. We're going to take advantage of these natural cracks that are in the ground, and we're also going to take advantage of the fact that we can put some energy into it. So the fracture is going to migrate along like this and hopefully crack those rocks. And you say to yourself, hey, why do you have to do this? Why can't you just go and gas anywhere? I mean, why, why do we have the fracture of the rocks? Well, if you look at this, take the Appalachian Basin here and imagine that's all the wells in the basin. Only 7% of them would be economic. In other words, you would be willing to pay for it to heat your water or your house and everything else without a hydraulic fracture. Those are the, the wells, the really good ones where you drill in and a lot of gas comes out naturally. 93% of them are going to require some sort of hydraulic fracture to encourage, to, to connect the ground with, this, with the gas on the surface. So I'm going to talk a little bit as quickly as I can about hydraulic fracturing. It's a common technique. In North America, approximately 60% of oil wells and 85% of gas wells are fractured. They're, the fracture itself is created when you pump water in the ground and greater than the stress that's in the ground so you can part the rocks. Okay. Conventional hydraulic fracturing is achieved by pumping some something in there that, if, if you can imagine, a creek running behind. We're hoping that we can build a pathway. You don't have to just make a crack. You've got to make a crack in the way that you can get out for the gas to get out. So you've got to put something in there. That's why we use the prop. We'll talk about that. To give you just a, and I'm going to go into more detail, but just to give you an idea, we're going to take water. We're going to mix it in a thing called a blender. I'll show you that. We're going to add prop, which is just sand, or in the case of wells that are very high stress, we have to use something that isn't going to crush in the ground, and that might be a, um, Resin coated or epoxy around the sand, or even a manufactured thing like a ceramic, which can be stronger. We're going to mix the two of those together, put them in a pump truck, which will up the pressure up enough to get it so that it can actually crack the ground with depth. And again, the cracks the cracks can create depth. We have a very good idea of the map a lot to know what's what's growing, where, where it's where it's actually propagating in the ground. Okay. Generally, we pump a pad of water. It's just water without sand in it. Then we pump a slurry of the fracked fluid and the propping agents. Okay, and sometimes we'll add different things to it. Now, I'll talk about this a little later. And then we have to remove the water so that the gas can come in and we can pipe that up to the surface. Okay, again, in the shale, if you look at this, we've got grains of rock that have gas and water and other things in between those grains of rock. All right? Permeability is the ability for water to move between those grains. And in shales, we just can't do that. That's the reason we have to do this. So if you look at a sand, like sandstone, a typical reservoir, you can see there's a little porosity, the spaces in between here. And for the most part, they're somewhat connected. So you can drill into a rock like this and the gas can find its way out. It's as if you all have a road from here, from where you are. With shales, it's a different kind of a material. So what we've got to do is the shale has got cracks in it already that I showed you. Plus, it also has gas adsorbed onto the molecules in the shale itself. So we have to do two things. We have to contact and get contact with that. We've got to reduce the pressure so that gas desorbs from those organic molecules in the shales. Okay? A typical Marcellus shale crack uses a lot of water because we've got a crack a lot of area. There's going to be the leak off into those cracks. Okay? We use quite a bit of sand because, again, we've got huge lateral descent that we need to drain the gas from. So that's that's why we use the product. Okay. This is a little more technical and I'm, I don't want to use a Tom's gonna pull my uh, pull me off here if I, if I go too long. But when we design a frack shop, let's say a, a, someone calls me, the, the customer wants to make the well productive and they also want to do several things. They want to use the least material they possibly can, the least water, because all that stuff costs money. So the, the design company, like ourselves, is trying to figure out, and then there's another ingredient. For years, when we worked on, on, on hydraulic fracturing before, we've been doing this in Pennsylvania for, I mean, my whole life, really, and it's been going on since 1940. But most of you never heard about it. it, it, it now that we're sort of in the radar, we have to also, ourselves included, have to figure out how can we make something that we can that we can use a material that's totally dependable to people because as you can see there's no question that the public is incredibly curious about what we're doing and, and curiosity doesn't need to really define what it is. I think that an awful lot of the public is very
very skeptical about it because for a long time in our industry, nobody can care. I went to a dinner party and people said, what do you do? And I started describing hydraulic fracturing. That was the quickest way my wife would say, you drove them off. You know, I mean, that's something I really enjoy, but other people don't enjoy. You know, they, they didn't want to hear about it. Now, when I'm at a, if I'm at a dinner party, my wife says, I'll bring up what you do. You've got all these people around us saying, oh, you're doing this and that, whatever. So it's a, it's a different world right now. We're looking at it. And partially because there's a lot of focus on it, because we've got so many dollars that we're spending for energy in other places, and we're so concerned about the environment. Should we have coal, windmill, or nuclear power, or whatever? And the, the truth of it all is, although I ride my bicycle 5,000 miles a year, most people don't want to do that. Most people want to get in their car and drive. They want to they want to have uh, iPods and everything else. So we are a society that needs energy. Okay, so let's, let's look at it. So what we're trying to do is to put as many cracks, I use this windshield, this is a dramatic picture, but that's what we want to do in the ground. We want to take the natural fractures that are there and enhance them and connect them and then prop those natural fractures so we can bring the gas out. Now the question that comes up to a lot of people is they say, what does this crack look like in the ground? And I hear a lot of people say, hey, just pump water there, you don't know where it's going or anything. And I say, no, that's, that's what I want. I mean, if, I was, if you were a company and I was going to say to you, we want to do some work on your well, I, I'd want to be able to tell you what that looked like. So back many years ago, some rock mechanics guys, actually from San Diego Labs and also MIT, started doing things to monitor what the fractures look like in the ground using micro size, so that they could use something they could instrument an offset and all work. Let's say, for example, you, you're right here. Craig Thomas is sitting right here. He's listening. Okay. You're an offset and off, all work to me. And every time I start to crack the rock, I'm going to make some noise here. It's not just the noise like I'm making with you. I'm going to do just like you do in an earthquake, which is as the rock shifts a little bit, as we pump water in there and releases some stresses, it's going to do two things. It's going to make a pressure wave and it's going to make a shear wave that goes this way. So as I walk across the stage, Craig's going to be able to hear me go. And just like a, a CAT scan does on someone, you use that information, you integrate it together, and you listen and you plot where that is. And you can actually look where the fracture's going. And I'm pretty sure because I loaded this on someone else's computer that we're not going to be able to show it. But I've got a lot of illustrations of, of microsizers. And afterwards, when we're done, seismic vision of something looks like. This isn't operating right now, and it's supposed to be. The left side shows the well order that we've got the tools in, and then the imaging graph. And that's what we're looking at. This is cutting the layer of cake in half, the, the cutting it like a cake, and then we're looking at it inside it. There's the well order. And here are the different formations. These have to be upper and lower formations. This was done before the Marcellus. But what you're watching, these are each individual stage of fracturing. And when, when I show it to you out there, you'll see that you can see the seismic events occurring here in each one of these zones, and it gives sort of a cloud of where the fractures are actually propagating in the ground. This has been used, it's essential technology used in developing um, Marcellus jobs because you do need to know where that fracture is going. Okay, let's see if I can get to this. Okay. This happens to be a cross-section view, and I've got some other stuff, of a Barnett job. And you can see here, you've got the Viola and Allenberg. Those zones down in Texas have a lot of water in them. The fracture, they don't want the fracture to go in there because all of a sudden, you're going to water the well out. This, these are pictures that show what the seismic events are going on during the fracture. Am I still okay, Tom? Yes. Okay. This happens to be a Marcellus. You've got an observation along there. We're looking at it like a bird. This is the treatment wall that we're fracturing in. And you can see the first stage, you can see where the fracture is growing. That's represented by these blue dots. Okay, the second stage by the red, and the third stage by the green. So what we're doing there is we're actually accessing that rock under the ground. And that gives you an idea how the tunnel would design the size and the type of these jobs. This represents something, just to give you an idea, which I think is really important, is this plots all the Marcellus, the tops of the fractures in the Marcellus that, that have been microseismically imaged. This is the depth of the well, that red line. And this is the depth of the water table. So in this way, you can see the, diff the, 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 the difference between the 
the, the bottom of the water table, the aquifer, and the top of the fracture. So there's a lot of there's a lot of space in there, which is why the, the gas isn't migrating up through there. Okay, let me keep going through here. Um, we've got a lot of interest. People tell me about water, and shale gas is very efficient in getting energy out of the ground using water. Okay. Um, now I'm going to take the inward frack job and show you what it looks like. Okay, this is what I've done my whole life. And it's, uh, it, out front you saw um, a, a frack van. I, I, I've got to update my slides. This is what we used to use, something like this, which we used to think was a big van. This is what it looks like inside. We take a wireless node out. We monitor the performance of the pump trucks and all the materials we pump, the gallons of it. The customer can sit over here, work with this computer to, to image all that and communicate with our operator that runs the equipment. That's sort of the, the nerve center. These are the pumps right here, okay? And really what you've got is just, again, lots of horsepower in terms of pumps and water, and, and we're pumping the sand and water in the ground. This is what one of the pump trucks looks like. It's got a large engine, transmission, and a pump on it. This is the blender that I mentioned. It puts the sand, it goes in the back. I'll show you some of that in operation. This, if you saw it on there, this would be a sand uh, hauling truck, it actually just has a belt on it. We fill it up with the sand that we use. Here we have several of them, of them on the location. This is a manifold that, that ties things together out there so we can get the water from the blender into the pump trucks and back to the well itself. It involves a lot of piping. This piping is 15,000 psi uh, pounds per square inch uh, rated. You know, pump it that high, but that's what the working pressure that it can use. When you talk about chemicals, and additives at our facilities, we have to do everything by the, the, the DEPs um, or DEC or whatever state we're working in. We've got the, the, the uh, containments and all the stuff that we need to. When we take it out on, on the location, we take the concentrated chemicals out and they're placarded and manifested. To give you a path for the, the process, we'll take water from either tanks or a uh, impoundment of some sort. That runs through some lines into a working tank, and then here's our blender. And that you can sort of see that process. Here's hooking up to the blender here. The things that we might add would be surfactants, and that's a fancy name for soap, a biocide. That's what you use to, uh, um, and I'll show you some other things about biocides, but that's what, that's what you use to uh, purify water. Scale inhibitors, for any of you that the, I used to live in an old house when my wife would flush the toilet downstairs and I was in the shower upstairs, I'd get burned because the pipes were scaled inside. We don't want to have that form in the, in the piping. Friction reducers, we want to use as small a hole in the ground as we can, and so it's easier to pump water with a friction reducer. All that does is sort of lubricate the water, and those are natural polymers, same things you use in a sewage treatment plant and that kind of stuff, and it just makes the water flow in a straight line, and it requires much less horsepower on the surface. Propens, that's what holds things open. Okay, the frac site that you saw, frac focus, we've been participating with that uh, for as long as it's been there and divulging everything that we have. I can take it to one of the local wells here. This would be a, uh, a Seneca well up in Potter County, and you can see it, and uh, that was all described on how you can look and see that we, what we were using in terms of our products. We have them all described by the percentages of things, so there's no, uh, uh, you, can see, you can see what's in there. I think it's important to look at it and take a bird's eye view of the job. Here might be our trucks out there. These are the only trucks here which might have the neat chemistry in them. So I think it's important when you look and think about the, if, if you were a, uh, a firefighter, I used to be a volunteer firefighter when you come out there, this would be the only place that the chemicals would exist in a, in a neat form, a concentrated form. After that, they're diluted at very low levels, like maybe one gallon of a product per thousand gallons of fresh water or water. Okay. We mix those things in the blender, and the combination of all that goes along this green line you can see at the bottom. That's where the sand goes in. And some of the chemical tanks that we have, they're DOT approved tanks. The province are just sand. And we, we get that from Michigan or Texas. Surfactants, that's a fancy name for soap. These are soaps I'm not trying to imply at all that we use Johnson's baby shampoo in fracturing, but I just want you to know that that's, that's a fancy name. This is something that we do to use, and I think for those of you that have seen uh, gas lamp or something else, I know that there's a lot of scary stuff about chemicals, but magnesium, iso, benzene sulfonate, sodium, xylene sulfonate, well, we use this stuff, um, I use this stuff every day, and uh, this has biocide in it, it's tricosin we use, and, and that's 
agents, with antibacterial agents. So I just think it's important that as you look at chemicals and, and additives and things, we have to look at that and figure out. In Pennsylvania, we put 775 tons of this down the drain every single day. In Pennsylvania, uh, all kinds of household cleaners and stuff under there. We use muriatic acid, which is the same thing as hydrochloric acid. And here I put this out of our morning paper. A lady had, uh, guy had some stuff on his driveway, and he said, oh, my driveway looks terrible. How can I clean it off? And she says, go get muriatic acid on full supply stores, and it'll remove that. So you do use things every day like we use. Pressure reducers, I described what the purpose of that is. Biocides, if we took water at the surface that had the uh, Birds that have gone to the bathroom in it or animals that have gone to the bathroom in it, and you introduce that down in the ground in a nice warm environment, the ground is warmer, it should get deeper. That would take any of the organics or anything down there and it will make the gas well sour. That will that'll build like a hydrogen sulfide in that, and you don't want that. Okay. I'm just showing you some uh, bactericides. Again, some trucks that we use. This is that uh, 15,000 psi working pressure iron that we use in it, introducing the well bore goes into the ground, then we have to bring the water back again, that's what the flow back, occasionally you'll see people flaring the well, they're removing, they're separating out the water and venting the gas or using the gas in the pipeline. If you look at how much water we use in the state, so compared to other things, this is uh, water that's used for watering golf courses. There's all kinds of technology right now, people are very concerned about the use of water, there's all kinds of technology right now to recycle water, uh, the majority of operators in Pennsylvania are recycling every bit of water that they possibly can. And I am now there's an uh, objective from the state to cooperate with operators to use acid mine drainage, which hopefully will clear up a lot of the streams because that's a big effort. Another great thing that we can use, we checked, is we can use effluent from uh, food treatment plants. We're going to make sure that that isn't going to compromise the job, but we use it in quite a few areas, and ultimately that does clean up the stream too. What we use in terms of the components in it, this recycled water piece, if you look at the fresh water, about 80%. Recycled water on a typical well would be about 14%, sand about 5%. If you look at that other um, three quarters of a percent, and that would be the different products that we pump along with it, the friction reducers, the biocides, and those things that I mentioned. Why is this so exciting to everybody right now? Because we have been in a picture where our energy in the United States has been dropping off. It's required us to be much more dependent. I don't have to give you the whole story on foreign countries, all the lives we send over to defend countries that have energy. Right now, we have the opportunity to become uh, energy independent and also use something which is a lot cleaner. The idea of uh, this, using horizontal wells, this would be one well pad at the surface, and I can show you some other pictures of that. The goal would be to have as minimum, as small a surface disruption as possible to, to harness the, the gas that's available in those, in those rocks there. This is a rocky uh, pad where you have a lot of wells on one pad. And, and I'm not against windmills or anything else, but I think that in part of the dialogue, it's important for everybody to remember that if we do as a country want energy, there's going to be an impact from it. And I think the oil and gas industry doesn't, is, is trying to mitigate that and be as transparent as possible. But there's uh, this is a, a well, multiple uh, wellhead site in Pennsylvania. I'll skip over that. I think this uh, this shows you one uh, uh, well board well site that's been reclaimed. I did grow up on a farm, so I have to put farm pictures in there. We have a lot of uh, requirements. One thing we don't in farming, we did not. Pennsylvania has about 1.3 million acres that are tilled, and we don't have to get a permit to do that. There's a, there's a question in a lot of people's minds is how the state regulators can say there has been no uh, evidence of communication in the hydraulic, from the hydraulic fracture to the surface. That, that's something which has a, a success rate better than any airlines or anything else. And I'd be glad to talk to you about that and get the information to you afterwards because I think that's a very important part of this. Um, if, you, if I had a, a list of all the regulations that we have to comply with, I thought I'd just show you something. This was the, the first draft of the New York State DEC's new regs. This was 887 pages. The, the latest draft is 1,650 pages. And I think it's still uh, 
don't look like you're satisfying people because there's enough regulations. I put the picture of the earth up there at the beginning to just ask the question to everybody because I have to ask it to my kids and everything else is that if you're going to use energy, and we get energy from overseas, having spent a lot of time working overseas, I can guarantee you that in no state, in no country, has got the amount of regulations that we have in this state, and I think the longer we're going to use energy, then it's a moral imperative to get from the states that we are living in, and that's my personal feeling. I want to talk to you one last thing about chemicals. Two more minutes, maybe, is that right? Is if you look at something, you look at an MSDS sheet, there's a material safety data sheet, Look at this, this material here, crosses mutagenic, hypogenic, or reproductive effects, burns, etc. This is the MSDS sheet for what is it? It's chlorine. Okay. One really important thing to look at in this whole process is that chlorine is absolutely a terrible thing unless you want to pollute it and drink it, and then we do that all the time. And I think there are benefits from using products that we have. I'm going to zip through this very quickly. I think that if you look at Pennsylvania and we look at it, in terms of the additives and things we put on the surface. Remember again, if you hear that so and so companies have spilled 2,000 gallons of something or whatever, almost all the locations in Pennsylvania do have containment, which means an impermeable layer under them. I don't think any other states are at the level that we are doing that. I think if you look at things that do go on the surface, like road salt, we use a million tons of road salt in Pennsylvania per year, and that just goes right onto the the ground, we also, Pennsylvania used, PennDOT uh, told me they used 9 million gallons of salt brine on top of the salt that they put on top of the roads. Those are things we have to think about because they're right, going right into the aquifers. I snapped this picture of Sagan Town of the Mitchell washer pool. If you look at that stuff, we're all using this stuff so we can see out of our cars and windows. That, that's 40% not gone, and I don't think anybody gathers that up. So we're surrounded by this. If you look at household cleaners that are under your sink, I, I defy you, nobody drinks this stuff, but you all use it. We're not going to drink, and that goes into our water supplies and things. The chemicals are something that we all have to look at. Agricultural land, millions and millions of pounds of things go on that too. So, what I want to finish up in is that, just to let you know, is that the process of hydraulic fracturing has been something that there's a group of people, scientists, that have been working their whole lives on trying to define and understand where it goes and to minimize the cost. The whole industry, the company that I run, we are absolutely clear, with no question, aware of the fact that people are very sensitive about all the materials that we pump. And, and one of the things that we started on probably eight years ago is this began to go to say to companies, we need to have the market steward version of this. We need to have the cleanest possible chemistry. And honestly, the customers that we work for, not only do they want that, they want us to figure out a way to use nothing. It would be nice if we could just use nothing and get gas out of the ground. But right now, we're just looking, trying to figure it out, just like when I clean my bicycle chain. In the old days, I used gas, and now I use a citrus based product. We're trying to find something to bring that still works. So, I think we have a lot of adequate protections out there. We restore the sites well. And I think when we look on this in a world standpoint and say, yes, if I'm getting natural gas or oil or some sort of energy from other places in the country. I think if you look at where we are right now, you fold your car going home tonight, you're going to be buying product from likely from another country that does not respect the environment like the people out of the EU. So I appreciate your time and I'll be around afterwards if there's anything more specific. I really uh, wish I could keep going. We might have to go a little long because uh, there's such good information, I'm sure you'll agree with that. Uh, that's the kind of information I think we need to share, and it's what Track Focus is all about. Uh, again, if you have questions, please write them down with your name and email on the white cards. Uh, we'll be collecting them, and I hope you can bring a few up to me uh, before the next speaker, or before the next speaker's talk, and that would be great. Uh, our next speaker is John Felmy, who is Chief Economist with uh, API, uh, and is going to talk about the economic uh, background of this. And his most important qualification is that he's a graduate of Jersey Shore High School. Uh, here in Lycoming County. So he's happy to come back here. And I, I, I know that the rivalry between Jersey Shore and Williamsport, so maybe I shouldn't have mentioned that, but uh, I know he's a proud resident of this area and uh, grew up along the Pine Creek uh, Valley and so on. So uh, he has a uh, substantial background in economics and is going to talk to us about that side of the picture. Thank you. John Tom. Thank you very much. Is, is this mic on? 
great. Is this mic on? Great, fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, I am indeed quite thrilled to be here. Uh, as uh, I am from, uh, graduated from Jersey Shore High, and uh, I do have a story that I can tell about uh, the rivalry with Williamsport at the end, but uh, it is important. I'm uh, excited. Uh, this whole development of uh, shale gas is um, truly a dream come true for me uh, because growing up in the Pine Creek Valley, I remember seismic crews going up and down all those highways as a kid. And I always wondered what they find. Uh, well, now we know. They found this huge block of shale. They knew there was a lot of gas in it, as I mentioned earlier. They just didn't know how to produce it. And so now we've seen the development of technology. We're able to produce it. We're able to generate the energy we need, the jobs we need, the revenue we need. And it's truly, truly exciting. Uh, you know, growing up along Pine Creek uh, was a beautiful area, and I'll show you in a minute. However, there aren't a lot of jobs. There weren't a lot of jobs when I graduated from high school in 1972, and it hasn't gotten much better until the shale gas development came up. So in that vein, let me start with a picture of about 40 years ago. Does anybody know who these folks are? Uh, who the person uh, talking in the microphone is? Or was? Well, that's Governor Milton Schatt. This is June of 1972, right after the Agnes Hurricane flood. Uh, the, the slightly younger redhead holding the microphone was me. And uh, what the governor came to uh, uh, the Piper Aircraft Factory uh, to take a look at Lock Haven and review everything and so on. And so uh, I was doing some work for Charles Cable, uh, which existed back then. I put on the only suit I owned, which my aunt and uncle had bought me for uh, graduation from high school. Walked up to the governor and I said, Governor, can you ask me some questions? And he kind of looked at me like, huh? You know, asked me. And I said, no, no, I'll ask you questions. Anyway, uh, I put that up there because, of course, Piper's gone. The suppliers, Atco, are gone. Look up the street from there, paper mill, gone. What you saw was a very bleak economy in there. And uh, when I was uh, in that uh, suit, you noticed that my hair's pretty short. Well, it's because it was short because I was cleaning up basements after Hurricane Agnes. And a lot of those basements, unfortunately, had asbestos in them. So what you see is basically a situation where we have had an economy here that is desperately in need of these new changes. I was a dirt poor country boy. I was lucky. I got to go to Penn State. Uh, I've uh, been uh, happy to see that this whole thing has changed. Because if I look back growing up uh, as a kid, you know, this venue here was something I would have never experienced as poor as I was. For that matter, they probably wouldn't have even let me walk into the Gen A hotel next door. So uh, it's really exciting to see that we now have an opportunity to be able to help the young people in this area to get good paying jobs and to actually have an opportunity. Yes, it's wonderful to be able to grow up in Pine Creek. This is a picture near uh, Jersey Mills, which is one of the area, one of the towns that I've lived in, a couple different locations and so on. Beautiful area. I never want to see this area destroyed or harmed in any way. Um, this is another picture, just slightly down in form. It's really a wonderful area. It's below the Pine Creek Gorge. It's something that I would dearly love to have lived there my entire life. But there's no, there are no jobs going on. Now we have an opportunity where people don't grow up from high school don't have to leave and can actually uh, you know, make a family supporting job in a way that we haven't had in a long time. Yet another picture of uh, an area that is fantastic. These economic impacts are huge. You know, this is an estimate from a while ago. I can simply say I, I won't review it because the jobs that happen from the estimate are far in excess of what's going on. It's really exciting to see that uh, what was anticipated has, um, you know, happened. Uh, if, for example, you go back and uh, does anybody know where the Grand Army of the Republic Highway is? Has any history buffs? Well, to those who don't know, it's US 6, which runs north of here through uh, the counties up there. Drive across that, that uh, highway, and I have through like, places like Troy and so on. You see things that you never saw, I never saw growing up. Help wanted signs. You know, you see help wanted signs of all different types. Because what you're seeing is opportunity, and there's no other solution to that. There's no other thing that is being proposed to do that does that. Oh, I hear a lot of them saying, well, we can do other energy. 
Well, those other energy forms don't survive without subsidies. And we've learned from some of the recent bankruptcies of uh, clean energy firms that you've got to understand what is realistic in terms of what, we're going, what we have going forward. What you have is a huge number of jobs that are basically what we call the direct jobs in the industry. You know, obviously the workers on the, the direct industry, you've got the supplying industries, the indirect jobs, you've got the induced jobs, economists call it, basically things that are surrounded by the communities and so on. It's a very real prospect. And I've heard people you know, say, oh, well, it's really not that many jobs. That's utter nonsense. The only people who are saying that is the people who just simply are opposed to any type of fossil fuel development or from places that have no understanding of what the reality of, of jobs are in terms of um, But, you know, there are, there are clearly situations where it's got to be done right. You know, as mentioned, the whole techniques of hydraulic fracturing and so on. And we at the American Petroleum Industry Institute are very, very clear about this has to be done, it has to be done right. We've been developing recommended practices, regulated, uh, recommended practices and standards and things like that since the 20s. And uh, you have, should follow these things. We've had a huge number of folks involved with, with creating them. Uh, this is a couple that are an example of it, for example, hydraulic fracturing. And if you want a real sample of what these things are, there are some binders out in the lobby that, that are this thick that break down everything that goes into this. So this is a practice that has to be done, it has to be done right, it can be done right. There's no question that there are local impacts. This is an industrial activity. You will have a, a significant impact in terms of things like traffic and so on that you all obviously have experienced in this area. Um, but it can be managed, it can be done properly, and the benefits are just huge. And I don't see other alternatives in terms of doing it. Uh, it is something that uh, needs, that the United States needs, as was mentioned in terms of our energy supplies. Um, this is a, an important chart because what I hear is some people saying, oh, we don't need this gas, we just need renewables. That's nonsense. This is the, where we get our energy in the United States. Down the left-hand side, this is from the Department of Energy, down the left-hand side is where we get our energy. 37% oil, 25% natural gas, 21 coal, 8 renewables, and 9 nuclear. And then how we use that energy. So for example, 28.5 is in transportation, 20 from industrial, 11 from residential, primarily heating, and so on, and 40 from electric power. And natural gas plays an important role. It supplies about 3% of the transportation fuel, about 32% goes to industry, primarily petrochemicals, which is really exciting for Pennsylvania because you may have a firm actually develop an ethane cracker and have more good jobs than you ever dreamed of in the past, and hopefully we'll see that come about. We've got 35% in residential and commercial, and we've already seen the benefits. If you happen to be a homeowner right now and you're heating with natural gas, you're probably paying about 40% of what a homeowner would be using heating with heating oil this year, according to the Department of Energy. So we've already seen the benefits. For example, 30% goes to electric utilities. That's yet another benefit, because what it means is electric power generation is a lot cheaper than it otherwise would be. What does that mean? Well, it means for the homeowners, it means for industrial industry, it means every type of benefit that is already in place uh, that is just truly wonderful. And we can expand the use of natural gas. Pennsylvania is going to be a next, net exporter of natural gas, which is something I never dreamed of as being possible. Uh, we can expand natural gas use in vehicles. We can expand natural gas use in power plants. There's a whole host of opportunities. But more importantly, when I hear talking about renewables, and believe me, they're very important for the future, but renewables do not exist without natural gas as a backup. Because solar doesn't have, doesn't obviously shine, shine all the time, and the wind doesn't blow all the time. And so if you want a secure power grid, you need that natural gas as a backup. So these arguments that somehow we don't need it just simply don't make any sense in terms of the reality of energy. But you know, that's the challenge we face in terms of Washington. If you look at the forecasts, and they just updated this, but basically what we, this forecast shows is we're going to need a lot of all types of energy. And I think it was really important that the president last night said, well, we need all of the above, because that's the first time I've heard it said uh, from the president. On the other hand, he did say something that wasn't especially good, and that's, well, we're going to take subsidies away from the oil and gas industry. We don't get subsidies. That's just political rhetoric in Washington. And in fact, if you change the tax laws, we are treated by tax laws like everyone else. If you change the tax laws, uh, you are going to severely affect the amount of operations of smaller gas firms going forward. And so let's not repeat Jimmy Carter's mistakes. 
where he raised taxes on the industry, reduced production, increased imports, and then poured the money down the drain of things that didn't work. That's all too possible in terms of the political reality of today. And so, what are the challenges we face going forward with natural gas? Well, first and foremost, our own success. Because you all have been very successful at producing, we've got low gas prices. And you, I just mentioned the benefits that go into all of that. Uh, what are the other challenges? Excessive taxes. You know, we, here in, in Pennsylvania, there's been a big debate over a severance tax. No, Pennsylvania didn't have a severance tax. But anybody who lives here knows how high the taxes are in Pennsylvania for anything you do. And so before you go forward with some type of excessive tax, which may destroy a, a wonderful opportunity, let's think about this carefully. There's no question the industry wants to, uh, we have to recognize we have an impact and we've got to be responsible for that. But let's be very careful about it, because what I see is all, a lot of the people who are calling for hugely increasing taxes just want to kill the industry because they don't like fossil fuels of any type. That's the reality of the politics of it and so on. So let's look forward, let's develop what we have, and let's uh, you know, recognize that this is an opportunity that only comes around once in a while. Oil and gas is going to be around for a very long time. This is the McClintic number one well, the oldest operating well in the world. It's 150 years old as of August. It produces a couple times a year. They sell the oil for the equivalent of about $11,000 a barrel, but it still works. And oil and gas is going to be around for another 150 years. And so anybody who thinks we're not is just uh, wishful thinking in that regard because we have very reality that we have to meet in terms of our needs. But we need balanced energy policy. We need to go forward with things that make sense. I agree we need balance. We need fossil fuels. We need renewables. We need energy efficiency. We need it all, and we've got to do it carefully and so on. But let's not repeat the mistakes of the past with excessive taxation, price controls, uh, international things that don't work, and so on. So let me close with a couple other stories. Uh, yes, I am from a competing high school. Uh, one of the last times I was before a crowd in uh, this town was 1972. I was a heavyweight wrestler on the uh, uh, Jersey Shore High School team. And uh, of course, the heavyweight wrestles last. And so I went into my, my match, and we were down one point. The Jersey Shore Bulldogs were down one point, and I had to win. Well, now up to that point, I had a perfect record as a wrestler. All the losses. So uh, that was a challenge for somebody. So I gave it my best. I worked, I did everything I could, and I tied. So we still lost. So I did do my best, but we still lost to the winning sport millionaires and so on. I'd also like to say that uh, I want to issue congratulations to a native son of uh, Williamsport. For those of you who haven't seen uh, the latest news, uh, Adam Saminsky, who is a native of Williamsport, uh, was just named, uh, was just nominated by the president to be the administrator of the environment of the Energy Information Administration. So I issue congratulations to all folks who are going to support that one of their native sons uh, is uh, taking a very high profile role in the administration. I've known Adam for a very long time, so I'd like to say he's a good Central Pennsylvania boy. And uh, he, he does uh, call him as he sees him, as the umpires do here for Little League Baseball and going to sport. So thank you very much for your time, and I guess we can now turn it to questions.
Another question is asking what the exception date for track focus is, and I think the real question is, uh, what are you doing about wells that are older uh, than 2011? Is the, the historic information. Track focus is a voluntary program, except for those states that I showed that they require to be pretty much track focus. Uh, the exception date was April of last year. Some of our companies are voluntary to play the board as well as well. Those who don't put too much information on those wells, it would be available in the state offices. So it will be a mixed bag. Sometimes it will be a place for our information. Correct. Will track focus also report on the amount of pullback recovery from wells after the crack in the Well, 
again, <clears throat> remember what I described to you is that the, the best, the, the thing you want to do is to increase the wellhead pressure as low as possible. That's the thing which allows two things. It's like anything, the well, the, the well will flow to its greatest extent if the wellhead pressure is as low as possible. The other thing is that's what stimulates the desorption of the gas molecules from the shale itself. So the, the whole goal in producing any shales is to run those pressures as low as possible to encourage the production and the, uh, the, the production and recovery of the, the gas molecules. Okay. Uh, this question is for John. And it says the figures for 2011 employment include out-of-state workers uh, that are brought in and uh, suggest that uh, it's not as, there's not as much local employment as it might seem. Well, I think that uh, clearly you do have some initial operations. We've got no out of state workers, but virtually every company that I've observed is committed to having local employment. But you have to have skilled workers. And so the challenge is being able to have trained workers. And fortunately, here in Rosewood, we've got one of the finest institutions that aids us in terms of Pennsylvania College of Technology. But you know, when I hear this nonsense that, oh, uh, these, these are just not many jobs, I mean, just drive across US 6 see the signs. I mean, uh, the only people I hear saying that is somebody who's never been to the areas where they're actually uh, seeing production. So uh, we're working, we want to have more local population, we want to make sure that we're good citizens and so on, but you have to have skilled workers because of the operations themselves. Tom, can I add yes. to that too? Because I think as far as our company, um, clearly right now there is a need for workers up here. That's John mentioned that's that's great. We have a training facility. I think when you look at the, the people that are coming in to this area, if you, if you say they're bringing somebody in from Texas, all I can tell you is the people in Texas don't like cold weather up here that much. What we see is a lot of people that, that might have lived up here that had uh, a lot of our employees that have come from other areas that have come because they grew up in western Pennsylvania, in our case, and wanted to be back near their, their families. Their parents are getting older and things. but. We're trying as quickly as we can. We hire almost all uh, native Pennsylvanians. And again, like uh, John mentioned, that there, you have to train people, but uh, the vast, vast majority of our employees, and I think with all the other companies up here too, because there are great opportunities right now, like Woodford Shale is very busy. So anybody in Texas that wants a job down there is going to have a job down there where it's warm and not come up here. So I think uh, uh, as we get more and more trained workers up here, you'll see fewer and fewer people that are from warmer climates because they don't want to be in the cold end. I would just add that in there was a tour that we ran back in October to visit the site next door to Sullivan County. And the, uh, the uh, drilling company there indicated that the day crew was 75% uh, local and the night crew was 100% local. Which I think ties into what you guys are saying. Uh, another question that I'm going to ask Question of whether any peer review studies that do a full cost benefit analysis of shale gas economic impacts, internalized externalities. So, I know people always talk about externalities this way or that way, but maybe you want to address that a little bit. Well, like anything in terms of externalities, it tells us the details. Economists will clearly argue that any type of activity needs to include externalities to be able to have proper pricing and so on. The problem is, how do you value that? You know, it's like a debate over climate change and so on. It, it can have values depending on across the board. In terms of externalities on gas, I don't think there's any doubt that gas is a cleaner burning fuel compared to other fuels and so on. So any notion of externalities beyond that I think is just, uh, just improper. You know, there's a big debate on whether or not uh, natural gas has more of a climate impact than coal. Well, I've seen the studies and they haven't convinced me one bit that it has a bigger impact than coal. I mean, the fact of the is uh, they're based on basically releasing a lot of gas. Our companies are not going to release natural gas. That's our product. So these arguments just simply don't hold water. And, and the peer reviewing of some of the studies I've seen is basically said that they weren't very good. Okay. Um, there's another question, and I don't know who the best person to answer this is, but the question is, why don't oil and gas companies voluntarily perform the EPA natural gas star program for DMPs? Anybody want to address that? I didn't hear it. It's, it's why don't gas companies voluntarily conform to the EPA's natural gas star program for best management practices? I'm not familiar. I, I, I'll tell you what the industry is. We are 
gets together to, to work on BMPs. The, the one issue that I think you have is that every single area is different. I mean, I, you can't do the same thing. I don't care whether it's farming or logging or anything else. We have a very different style of job that we do and um, you know, how we perform it and other things. So it's a very local kind of thing. So I, I think that, that uh, that's one of the reasons why I think that the, the states are so good at, at regulating this because if you talk to Lynn Helms up in uh, North Dakota, they've got a completely different way that they deal with, with uh, shale production up there, et cetera, than we do in Pennsylvania. Right. That helps it. Uh, another question is uh, about propane gel. Do you want to address that, Roger? Is that, is that something that your company's taking a look at at all? You know, we, we haven't. Um, if you look at the, the again, the, what the question is, you can take propane and put a viscosifier in it and make it carry the sand. And the idea would be that you pump something, a hydrocarbon down to carry the sand out, and then you can bring the propane back out again and, and reuse it. And uh, the question is, is that economic to do something like that in, the, in, the, uh, in terms of getting a large enough fraction to get enough propane out there? And I think the studies are being done on that. We don't do that right now um, simply for a concern about trying to pump uh, we pump water, we pump water, we pump something that, again, it's, it's very safe to pump, and the, the question of pumping liquid gel propanes is concerning, but I think that that's something that people are looking at, and the economics will decide, and the producer ultimately will say, is that, does that fit into their the mix of the way they want to do it, and that the market will take that one, but we don't do that right now. Okay. We also have a couple of questions about uh, why can't we enclose and capture the energy wasted in flare? The only time that people, there's two reasons that you flare a well. If you're bringing out, if you're in an area that has absolutely no gas pipeline, you're right. Believe me, at these flow rates, nobody wants to vent that gas. That's just money. People just look at it like a farmer testing a cow and just pulling it on the ground. It, it, the, the, the situation is that if you don't have a market for it, there's two instances you use generally for flaring is to do a short-term test so you can decide what is the size of the pipeline you need to develop to put into an area, and you can only do that by really uh, flow testing the well. And sometimes when they're drilling out the plugs that are, that are in the well as the treatment's going, you've got a lot of material coming back, and that has to be separated out. That has to have high rates to carry it out of the, out of the well bore and things, and that's another case where you, you flare well. If someone has a particular question, you can uh, get with me on the side. Yeah, Thank you for mentioning that. I think I'm not going to give you a chance to comment too. But we will have an opportunity when we finish if you have a detailed question. We have other people here who are willing to answer them as well, in addition to the three panels that are up for this evening. So we have a number of people who can help answer questions. But John, in terms of gas flow, the biggest area where you gas flow is in the bottom area where the primary product is oil. And you don't have the pipelines, as was mentioned, to be able to, to extract it. So it's a safety matter. You have to flare it until you have sufficient production to be able to have the pipeline infrastructure to be able to get it. We have seen some new developments up there where you're starting to see enough of the development that uh, you may see that uh, infrastructure come in place. But it's valuable product. We certainly don't want to uh, let it go into itself. Okay, Amber, I'm going to take three more questions and then we'll call it an evening here. Another one for you, John. Why is gas being produced going overseas? Do you want to address how much is going overseas, first of all? Why would you export natural gas? The same reason you export everything else. You know, the president's called for doubling exports to be able to jo generate jobs uh, in this country. And so exporting natural gas, like exporting cars or food or anything else, keeps jobs in place, improves our trade balance, and uh, has a lot of positive things. Because right now, if you have infrastructure that doesn't allow you to be able to get gas in the market, say from the, from the Gulf Coast, uh, exporting it makes sense. It's a high value product. And unfortunately for some people, for some reason, people want to treat energy exports as different than every other manufacturing export, which they consider good. So I just am puzzled by those arguments. Uh, the last two questions I'm going to combine because they relate to the same subject. Uh, we have time here. There's a concern that injection of wastewater uh, into underground wells may be 
was with earth rates from Ohio, what's the difference in injecting these wells and how they are to fraction of the well? I know there's been a lot of debate about that and a lot of confusion about those Ohio situations. So, John Ferrari, can you tell us about that? Uh, again, as, as I mentioned to you, just doing micro seismic, because you put water on the ground, you can shift things a little bit. The, the case of the injection wells, there's, there's several places, if you look it up, and if somebody's interested in getting more information on it, I have some of that. Um, you know, there was a case in the Fayetteville where they, if, if you're injecting water and there are some pre existing um, faults in the ground down there, those, those faults can be, I can't say lubricated really, but partially opened up by, by putting fluids down there. And in those cases, like what they've done in, in uh, Arkansas, is to say, we've delineated there are fractures in the ground, we're not going to allow people to inject fluids in there because it might cause. Um, some sort of a tremor that can be felt, and, and they're very weak. But I think that same thing, if, if you were to peel back the surface of the earth here, you'd find that it's fractured underneath the ground everywhere we are. There's no place where there is just one solid. There's lots of pieces on top of it. So the areas where the injection wells are, a lot of that is governed by the UIC, and they'll monitor the injection pressures, and what they'll do is, is subject those areas to lower injection pressures, and that's, that's all being monitored, and again, that's so highly on the radar that the likelihood of anything uh, propagating to the point where it causes any effect like that, that's going to be watched like a hawk everywhere it is. So, I don't know if that answers the question. I think so. Uh, very good. I want to thank all three of you for being uh, excellent speakers this evening. And